Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Design and Dialogue. Um, I'm very happy to uh, be welcoming Georgie Stout, creative director and founder of 2x4, um, to the program this morning. Hi, Georgie, how are you? Hey, good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Um, thank you so much. For, here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have, um, Georgie is, uh, as I mentioned, creative director and founder of 2x4. Um, 2x4 does a lot of things. The only way I can describe it, I guess, is a creative agency. Um, working across all scales and well a lot of different scales from from print to uh, digital to architectural and interior um, for global brands around the world so uh, Georgie I just wanted to know before we get started we have a lot of uh, powerful images to look at um, before we get started looking at the images I wondered if you could give us a little bit of a uh, um, just say a few words about the structure of two by four and your sure. partners who aren't joining us this morning. Yeah, so I think we, I mean, we describe ourselves, like you said, as a kind of global creative agency and our work does really span, you know, everything from brand identity and print to architectural spaces and a lot of kind of 360 activations or, um, you know, experiences that are kind of a holistic brand experience. So when you're really trying to communicate a brand's essence through like everything from the invitation you get to what the room feels like to the music, you know. Um, so we really think spatially in that way. And we do that through having a studio that is like hyper collaborative and really kind of media agnostic. Like in a way we, we all wore, um, trained as graphic designers, but um, through our experiences and through kind of adding team members, we now have a really strong um, strategy department that does a lot of writing and thinking and researching. And um, then we have a brand department, which is, you know, mainly print, graphic design, brand identity, paired with a digital team, um, an environments team, which is kind of the bridge between 2D and 3D. And then we have an architecture team which help us realize a lot of the work, um, you know, and that usually is at the scale of like an exhibition or a pop-up, but we also do a lot of retail spaces and we have done a few kind of ground up buildings that are either repurposed buildings or um, standalone things for events like the Olympics. So wow. it really is a really wide range. Um, and so it's super interesting to work with a group of people who you know, have all of those different disciplines. And we tend to, when we have a project, um, we tend to kind of create a team for that project. And so each project has a kind of hand curated team, you know, depending on what the needs are, or what the execution might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know from the very beginning, you aligned yourself with architecture, um, yeah. even down to um, your very strong uh, logo and the name of the studio. Too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, I kind of think of you and your the studio as as pioneers of a, a new way of, of working, designers in service of design, in a sense. Of course, you're doing a lot more than that now. Yeah. But, um, as we get into the early work, I'd love to hear more about that. And, and sure. I guess a, a, a kickoff question would be, how did you, um, was that a strategy from the beginning or is that something that happened quite organically? So... Well, why don't I, why don't I share my screen and I can start to show, because I think there's a lot of projects that help kind of describe how we got to where we are and started thinking the way we think. Um, first, just to, to start off by acknowledging my two partners. Um, obviously, we, we are very much a collaborative team. And I think um, Michael Rock and Susan Sellers and I met actually at RISD where we all um, practiced mm -hmm. and learned our trades. Um, Susan and I were undergraduate majors and, and Michael's a graduate and also taught there. But um, we really started um, our practices separately and then came together as two by four working in the print and branding world. And so a lot of our work was 2D, mm -hmm. but it was really, um, I would say we were deeply involved in like the content 
of the work we did. And so we were always really interested in not only the formal quality of what we were making and always trying to, you know, rethink what is a book? Like, how can we make a binding in a new way? Or how can we have a book that reads backwards or has a center that changes or something formal? But we also were really invested in the content and how we could really tell stories through visual tactics or through image making. Um, and so I think that sort of caught um, the attention of different architects because it was a way of thinking that was really visual. Um, and Susan and Michael uh, were initially, they we were practicing as rock sellers um, and I was practicing by myself and we shared a space. So a lot of our work was kind of fluid in the beginning, not so much tagged as a two by four project, but uh, mm -hmm. one of the big projects we started with was this um, project for architecture in New York. Um, and it was almost like a tabloid of current architectural thinking. And this was how we really forged a lot of our early relationships um, with different architects because we would work with them to help kind of um, convey a project that, you know, in a lot of times there were competitions or things that we were showing that weren't really realized. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of, you know, playing with language and form and models and sketching and all the things that they were working with to convey a project. Um, just, to, just to give it a little context, Georgie, can you give us a sense of what year um, you started this collaboration? And, oh and gosh, this was probably 1990, um, I want to say 1994. Mm -hmm. So this was way back um, and it, it sparked a lot of early relationships with the architects that we still work with today. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our, our kind of seminal relationships that we made during that time was with um, OMA and Rem Coolhouse's studio and they, they actually shared a space with us initially um, and my partner Michael was a, one of the partners um, in AMO as as that project began which is the research project really that they they do a lot of research projects and so as um, as we progressed we started to also really connect with kind of cultural institutions and a lot of our early branding work were for um, just museums all across the states and even a lot of internationals. Um, I think one of our first uh, New York projects was the Brooklyn Museum um, and also DIA and Studio Museum. I think those all happened within a couple of years of each other early on. Um, also the Clark up in Williamstown. A lot of these are also more recent. For example, the Broad or um, Glenstone are ones that we just recently worked on in Lincoln Center a few years back. But this was something also that we were doing in tandem with a lot of the architectural work that we were doing. And it kind of merged when we started to um, look at, for example, Brooklyn Museum, where we were doing a project with them that was to redefine the brand identity there um, in tandem with, uh, at, at that point it was Polshek Partnerships, now it's Enyad, but they were redesigning the facade of the museum. Right, it was kind of relaunch of the Brooklyn Museum. Yeah, and I think that was um, like 2004, I think. Um, but the point of the renovation was to really create a space for the community, you know, which is something that museums are talking a lot about now. How do you be more inclusive? How do you include people that live around the museum or that don't necessarily understand or are intimidated by the idea of art. Um, yeah. So we worked with them to both rename it the Brooklyn Museum as opposed to the Brooklyn Museum of Art, um, but also to try to come up with an identity that felt really dynamic and kind of friendly and a little bit more welcoming to a more mass public. And this is the first time where we um, developed a brand identity that was completely malleable. Like it was, you know, kind of old school branding is that is all about hyper consistency. Sure. And the idea here was that, you know, wanting to reflect the communities that we're going to, that we're trying to address and open up to, and that we're not all alike, and that we need to be much more public and kind of, um, kind of mass in a way to when we're thinking about brand. 
in fact, this is the beginning of a discussion about diversity, right? Exactly. I mean, looking yeah. at Brooklyn as a very diverse community, but then also looking at um, branding and graphic design and the, and the potential for this, this fourth dimension, which exactly. can speak to different constituencies. Which I think is so relevant right now. And they were a really early adapter to that. So that's interesting. Absolutely. Um, so that brand identity, we worked closely with both Polshek to enact it in the physical space. So we did a lot of work that was about bringing it into the architectural space, but here showing just how it was a very eclectic kind of system where like they could use different logos and different marks and different kinds of applications. Um, and then working to make these kind of really large gestures in the space. So there were these big LED signs at the entrance that were kind of welcoming and had different kinds of messages. And this was, it's funny now when I look at it because it seems very typical to use LED, but at the time, yeah. the coding for this, for example, was like we were <laughs> hacking the system to be able to even make it flexible. Right. Um, you know, that, that rotating logo was done just through GIFs because there wasn't like, if we had done that, that identity now, we probably would have made it um, something that would just react to something and kind of change every time. But that wasn't just wasn't physically possible then. So it's a little bit of an old school approach to this. But I think it was a really interesting one of the first identities. I still feel like it's really fresh today when I see it. Um, they don't use the blue anymore. It's now black and white, but I still feel like it feels relevant. Hmm. Um, and, and obviously there were cases where the mark was appearing without the name. Exactly. Um, I think you showed the t-shirt prior. Um, were they, were there any, um, in a traditional sense, you might do focus groups, you might, you know, uh, do some marketing around that. Were, were they nervous about that kind of uh, implementation? No, they were really excited about it. Um, I think that they had this opportunity and they really were making a shift. I know that they were criticized a lot actually when they first started thinking about um, how to address the public, like they were accused of like dumbing down messaging and stuff because they were doing really large wall captions and kind of painting walls in ways that were really not traditional in terms of the museum audience, but I think that they were just really early adapters and were smart about that. And that was when um, Arnold Lehman was director there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of my fondest memories because the original brand identity was, was uh, by the Vignellis. And I remember um, speaking at Design and Daba and yeah. they were sitting in the front row <laughs> and I was presenting this brand and I had this sudden like, angsty moment where I was like, oh no, I feel like I'm somehow critiquing their work, you know? Right, right, um, right. But when I came off stage, he came over and gave me a big, you know, pat on the back and was like, I love the Brooklyn Museum identity. It's so fresh. So well, I feel like it's just like a moment in time where things shifted in branding from something that is, you know, really a strict system where you're trying to be rigid and that is how people remember you to being kind of more malleable and open and getting people's attention from a different angle in a way. Yeah, and I mean- think of MTV was probably the first adapter to this kind of a, a brand. Sure, yeah. sure. And it also almost, I mean, that's, that's mid early millennium, millennium, it almost corresponds with, with mobile, right? Yeah. The idea that Barely, your ad yeah. <laughs> ends up being everywhere. Yeah. So this this collaborative approach and and the the Brooklyn Museum's kind of graphic outreach, I think, was very prescient um, yeah. at the time and speaks to your way of working going forward in terms of your kind of spatializing of graphic design and branding. Yeah, and the next, I think, to that point, I think the next project which I wanted to show is a really early one. Also, IIT. This was actually a year before we did my alma mater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I think this is Cool House's first built project in the U.S., if I'm correct, I That's think. Right. Um, and we actually worked with them on the competition, which they won, obviously. And it was a really interesting project because he, you know, is super conceptual and thinking about this. Um, the idea was to build a, a student center that kind of bridged the two sides of the campus so there's a kind of traditional architecturally speaking there's like the traditional side that was all designed by 
Brandero. And then there was a kind of newer side. And there is this sort of barren um, area where the train went through campus that, you know, the students had kind of run all of these footpaths through, but it was a little dangerous and dark because it went under the elevated train. And so he sort of perversely chose that as his site for it, which helped kind of bridge the campus, but also was this kind of engineering feat because he had to wrap the tube in the mm-hmm. soundproofing. And so the building itself was a little bit unremarkable in terms of architecture, like on purpose. It, it's just about creating this really open plan, almost like a almost like a Home Depot or something, but that every surface is really important. So, you know, he left, I think it was the first building where he did this really exposed um, sheetrock, you know, where the spackle was like artfully done. And it was just a really amazing, um, in terms of materiality, like you can see here, all of the choices they made around um, glass that had, you know, was like embedded with color or all of these different things. And so it was all about surface. Mm -hmm. And so our job was to kind of imbue a kind of branded um, identity within the surface of that. So this is not about like developing a logo. It's more about developing a kind of experiential idea about brand. And so I think of this as almost uh, you developing the, the the architectural identity, right? Because to be in dialogue with kind of experiential, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like for the students themselves to to feel like it's a fun place. It's kind of a weird thing. There are little secrets and Easter eggs that you can find in the graphics. <laughs> but then like this this front door is kind of an homage, like a big portrait of Mies um, mm-hmm. made of these pixels. But then you start to see that the pixels, you know, we developed all of the pixels based on this idea of a kind of a student so this is like if this is like a generic student we started to make all of these different kinds of activities that Mm -hmm. theoretically you could do in a student center so everything from playing to bowling to studying to drinking coffee to you know we we started to embed all of these little easter eggs like you know putting someone's head in the toilet or (laughs) like (laughs) falling down the stairs or making out or all these things which the client of course nixed a bunch of them but we're cheating you can kind of see on the upper left so it was sort of like trying to engage um the students also in the in the kind of play that's happening here and so there are these big formal prints but then when you get close up, you see that they're actually all made up of those characters. It's also very successful at linking the past with the present because the characters you've chosen, you've chosen are all historic uh, right. IT figures, in a sense, beginning with that Mies portrait. So it, it, it's almost aspirational for the students. You're in the student center now, but right. look at where you could be. <laughs> right. It was a very interesting approach. It was also kind of our first large scale signage and wayfinding project, which, you know, um, we have a love hate relationship with because I think that, you know, on the one hand, signage and wayfinding is, I think it's really important and there are so much that you can do visually with it. And, and it's obviously like there's a, an art to it. You're drawing people through a space and you're helping direct the way that they encounter things and find things. At the same time, there's a a huge amount of technical work involved. There's code. So there's like, it's both super creative and also really technical and can get really heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're always sort of balancing, you know, how we approach it. But I think this project and many that we did since then allowed us to be like super creative. So this is like branding or kind of identifying the student study area. We never say that, but we use this kind of icon to demonstrate it across the wall. So I think that was our first project where we really um, were able to take kind of a lot of the graphic work that we'd been doing and embed it in this really kind of fun physical space that was intentionally all about surface. And I think, I mean, that was the beauty of collaborating with a firm like OMA is that they acknowledged um, and really felt that graphic elements were super integral to their 
building design. And I think that was the first time where, and, and this project, you know, got a lot of attention and um, was our first kind of big visible project. And it sort of led us on this path of being able to do graphic um, signage and wayfinding environmental design and different things that really were at this hyper scale that I don't think a lot of graphic designers were doing yet you know, or didn't have the opportunity to do yet because a little bit architecture was like, we don't want things on our walls. We want the walls to be about the material, right? And so here is a moment where it's like, we're purposely putting sheetrock walls throughout so that we can do something on the surface. And when we're not doing sheetrock, we're doing a really like interesting materiality that we've chosen. Yeah, in fact, you're integral partners in the project. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this, this speaks a lot to um, your way of working going forward and your ongoing collaborations with uh, OMA. Exactly. Um, and it, it, it actually, I guess we'll see more, of course, but it makes me wonder um, about the influence of OMA on 2 by 4s work and 2 by 4s work on OMA. Because yeah, I think we do have a really like sympathetic way that we've worked together um, in the past. We continue to work with them today. We're doing a big project right now at Tiffany's with them. Uh, we just did the Sotheby's project with them. So we continue to work with them a lot. Um, and I do think that there is definitely a moment where we were really embedded um, because we were literally sharing space and hmm. a lot of um, OMA's early competitions we would design the materials for so but they were obviously like heavily into what they were but a lot of them were books for example which was kind of not necessarily accepted early on like to do a book as a as a competition entry rather than like big you know foam core panels with your renderings mm -hmm. i think they were one of the early adapters to trying to tell trying to use narrative and storytelling and you know pacing and to tell the story of a building rather than just showing like a big rendering of it and some models so yeah technologically speaking um i wonder if in a sense you anticipated the uh the kind of large scale graphic potential right as as these graphic prints and billboards yeah. etc became more um easily uh, producible, let's say, right? Yeah. You, you're in this collaboration with OMA that allows you to implement it at a large scale. Yeah. And then that becomes part of the language of OMA in settings like this, right? Sure. So there's this kind of integrated uh, long-term collaboration that we'll see more of. The best example. <laughs> the best example. <laughs> um, when you said that, I started to think, well, actually, like a lot of what what's interesting, so they also... Um, invited us to be a part of their um, design for the Prada Epicenter stores. This is the Soho store um, right. that opened, I think this was um, 2002, like it was right at 9-11 basically. The store was slated to open right that week of 9-11. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a tricky time to open a store, but they um, had a very close relationship with the um, Mr. and Mrs. Prada and her notion of trying to create a retail experience that was not only about shopping, but about um, art, about culture, about having events, about being able to show different kinds of um, lectures and things that happen in the store. So becoming much more of a social space and less of a singular shopping experience. Yeah, and so they about, invited us to do... Yeah. They invited us to do this one gesture, which is one large scale wall, a non-repeating mural that's essentially like a city block long. And it changes um, every six months. And so we've been doing that project since when the store opened and we continue to do it now. And it really does change the physical kind of atmosphere and feeling in the store dramatically. And so it's like this really interesting, simple gesture. I mean, obviously it's really long wall. And so it's difficult to, it's not that it, it's not expensive or not, um, you know, impactful to change it, but it 
in a sense, it's just changing a wallpaper. Right. Um, you know, we'll occasionally do things like in this case, we actually had these old masters painted in um, China by these kind of um, counterfeit painters mm -hmm. um, to develop this one long mural. But these are all individual canvases that are collaged on top of each other. So occasionally it will have a different form. Mm -hmm. Or here um, we did a wallpaper and then the, the next iteration of it was to have someone come in and kind of drawn graffiti all over it. So it does have a materiality occasionally, but in general, it's just a vinyl wallpaper. And so actually gets changed out overnight over the course of two days. And, you know, it really changes the feeling of the space radically from one moment to the next. And sometimes it's, um, it's one of our favorite projects in the studio too, just because it's it's really the most collaborative thing that we do. It's something that everyone in the studio wants to work on. So like you could come in as an intern and you know propose a sketch, or you could be a, a strategist and propose a sketch that's all about language, or you could be on the digital team and propose something. And so we've done all different kinds of things. I think the running joke in the studio is that the day your design gets chosen is like, the most exciting day and then the next day is like your biggest nightmare because you have to actually produce it in high res and it's like the hardest thing to do it's like one of those things where you're like doing photoshop collages but, for two but months that, but Georgie, <laughs> that brings up an interesting question i mean it, could this have been possible before and how would you have done that i mean i'm interested in your use of collage and this tension that two by four strikes between sort of traditional graphic references, digital production and print, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably the best example and almost, I don't know, I, I might argue the most visible example. Yeah. It's a block long billboard that can be seen through all the windows of the store, so. Sure. Um, I mean, in a weird way, this is a little bit old school, right? In terms of producing it. I mean, I think technically it's difficult because of the scale, like mm -hmm. the, the amount of, you know, memory one of these files takes up literally is insane, but it can be hand drawn. It can, we've had, we've also commissioned people, this is a one that we commissioned, but we've also commissioned people to do like oil paintings that are, you know, this big and then we blow them up to a huge scale. So in a way this is a little bit non-technical because right. it is really about whatever the idea is, whether it's collage, whether it's, a really highly digitized Photoshop collage, or in this case, um, this was for uh, the spring 2018 women's show. We actually uh, developed this whole campaign of women um, cartoonists and illustrators kind of um, drawing super women superheroes, women mm -hmm. illustrators drawing women superheroes. Um, and we, we um, we use like uh, some of the archives of Tarpe Mills and then we hired kind of more contemporary people to do it and collage this really big moment around powerful women. And it started as um, actually as the show itself, which is this project. So often we'll do fashion shows where we're kind of, you know, creating a holistic designed experience for the show itself so and here, then that gets used back in the store yeah this introduces uh, a, a kind of another series of questions because here your client is not only room cool house but also prada yeah um, not only oma but also prada and and i guess um maybe we're going deeper into the prada discussion but i'm i'm wondering um at what that collaboration is like are right. you are you producing work speculatively and introducing it, or are you uh, somehow briefed on the designs of that season? Yeah, it's super interesting. That, that informs, how, how does that, what's that dynamic like? So the very first wallpaper I showed um, was commissioned by OMA, but we were brought, you know, we were presented to Prada and then we were hired by Prada to do it. All of the work since then is done directly with Prada and specifically directly with Mrs. Prada. And um, 
Michael, my partner Michael and Mrs. Prada have a very close relationship in terms of like collaboration. And he really is the one who has that relationship. But what's interesting is that a lot of the work is not, it, they're very open to just being interested in, in kind of our take on where they are culturally in the moment or what the collection is. But a lot of times it's not, it's not directive, like I'm going to do this kind of collection. And so the wallpaper has to be about that. Right. It may be more like a notion she has around like kind of big ideas that she's thinking about. And so some of the wallpapers I was showing back here, um, you know, these are not necessarily connected at all to the collection that's coming out, but more of a big idea that might be going on in the world somehow. Sure. Whereas this one, but what can often happen, which is interesting, is that when we do develop some of these pieces, because of the notion of fashion, you know, it happens right up to the last minute. So in this case, a lot of the designs that we developed for the environment then became um, part of the collection. Really? So it's a little bit like this <laughs> back and forth because she loved the imagery so much. So then, you know, a lot of the products then had the imagery on it. Huh. So it's, it's kind of interesting fascinating to see the back and forth so um but yeah there isn't really ever a brief and in a way it is we we over deliver on it we like she'll have a few maybe keywords or it might be like some images she's thinking about and then everyone will design really rough ideas and another great thing about our relationship is because we've worked together for so long the ideas don't actually need to be so polished they can just be like notions, you know, and everyone sketches kind of in this elevation of the wallpaper, but they can be very rough. They could be sketchy. They don't have to be really realized for them to see the potential or to understand the concept. And so we can deliver like many, many ideas and then they usually get honed down to two or three and then eventually one. If I'm not mistaken, Mucha's, Mucha Prada is now collaborating with Raph Simmons. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious. Um, how has that affected, that new relationship affected your relationship? That's a good question. We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> so far, we still, we're still working with them a lot. We also have a close relationship with them in terms of the Fondazione Prada. We do a lot of work there. And so we, we're continuing to do a lot of work. But I feel like the moment right now is a little bit uncertain because I, I think they just need to start that relationship then. Um, I was just actually looking at the fashion show yesterday. It was so beautifully done. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of what sparked my, my thinking really in the, when you first brought up our relationship with OMA is that we actually both kind of intermittently do a lot of the showscapes for them. So OMA will do one, we'll do one. And it gets blurry to the point that like sometimes we'll do one and we'll see OMA credited in the press or sometimes they'll do one and there's like some comment about it. So um, you know, sometimes they're just more architectural and sometimes they're more graphic. And so I think that there's this really fluid relationship that we continue to have with OMA there. Um, but I noticed the, the Prada show, I was looking at it yesterday, it was all these kind of um, cameras that were coming down from the, the ceiling that, and the models were actually walking around this virtual space. It was really well done. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't know who did it. I was going to go research that. Yeah, I think I'll so, go research that too. <laughs> okay. um, this is a different kind of project really and this is a, a kind of a little bit more traditional in terms of brand identity mm -hmm. because um, it starts with a brand logo and kind of a way of talking about uh, a brand and a visual language attached to it so Georgia, in the most traditional yeah. sense before we begin this, can you, I mean, Arper uh, is one of the most beautiful uh, brands in Italian uh, home furnishings and, and contract furnishings. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about um, Arper and its kind of position in the market, its history, et cetera, that led to this project. That's a good question. I think that when we were brought on board, um, I mean, I think Arbor has always had that tradition that you say and always had a really amazing reputation, but it wasn't very um, public facing. In a way, it was very much a contract brand, right? And it had um, a history and it had a whole uh, set of 
um, products already that were very strong, but it, it wasn't speaking to the public. It was very much speaking to the industry. And so when we were brought on board, um, we were actually brought on board uh, by one of the creative directors um, to help rethink how they could become more a part of um, the kind of dialogue that was happening really among the more general public and specifically how could they have a presence in Milan that really started to talk to the design public, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when we first started, um, we worked closely with them to try to rethink what are their principles? Like how do they talk about themselves internally and how could we talk about that or, or translate that into a visual language and even a verbal language that they could all share and it would become something that people would recognize outside of the industry. And so part, there's a huge strategy phase that goes with a lot of our projects that's about unearthing like who a brand is, what is their kind of essential quality. Um, so this is a little cheat sheet in a way of like how we've come to this. But, um, you know, this idea of being modern or refined or intelligent, functional, ergonomic, these are things that they were able to talk about internally, but they've never really been able to express it externally. And so part of our role is to take those qualities and start to think about how can you visually make that come alive, right? So, for example, all of the photography on the right is work that we did to try to express this idea of being human or being both functional and human or having, um, you know, these kind of ergonomic qualities, but also this really organic quality. It's so, funny because I, I see those pictures as very Bauhausian somehow, like really in a way, yeah. going back to, um, I don't know, uh, something, something about looking at things in a, from a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and when you speak about essentialism and, and Harper, what I think has been most successful about this project is, is how you've abstracted the forms and, mm -hmm. and given the formal vocabulary and, and color of Harper um, quite a strong presence. Right, and so, and I think that's one of their qualities that I've always thought, that I was always struck by not only how like well made and beautiful the furniture is, but like the palettes they choose and the materials they choose. It's so, it has such a kind of soft, but like really powerful point of view, which I feel like it's much, it's been absorbed a lot actually. I think when they first had their first show, it feels like a lot of other brands and a lot of other brands were also doing it really well. I'm not saying that they weren't, but I feel like it became much more a part of the language of those brands to be like, to have these really kind of daring color palettes, like a really soft pink with a bright orange stitching or whatever. Like a lot of those little details started to really be important. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I think we absorbed that in terms of how do you present that in terms of like these kinds of materials that in a way is what everybody does, right? When you go to Milan, you get, a million catalogs um, from all different kinds of brands, but trying to really embody the materiality, the colors, the feeling of the paper in the brand so that it felt connected and reminded you of the furniture, right? right. And even in the physical build of that space, trying to come up with a, you know, Milan is, is a fair where you go, you have what, three or four days to present your work and this booth, which is usually pretty monumental in scale, has to be like built, um, like planned, built, constructed, deconstructed, um, sure. you know, in the a few days. The investment by these brands is huge. Yeah, and it's, it is. it's essentially how do you take that um, branding and graphic language and, and, and turn it into an architectural project? Right. So as, I mean, over the course of that Salone week, right, as we're wandering through, and obviously my focus is on the furniture and, and on sure. the details, but I'm, but I'm also looking at, you know, is this a brand that um, appreciates, uh, the, uh, has a more refined take on culture, right? right. Or understands itself at, at all scales, from the print material to, uh, 
to the structure of the booth. And so even before I knew you were working with Arthur, I was looking at these catalogs <laughs> and I was understanding that there was a connection. And I, I guess yeah. that, that leads me to my next question. I wondered, um, are you in direct dialogue with the furniture designers? I know Arthur works yeah. a lot with Liv Livor, Ater, uh, Molina. Exactly, yeah. And Jeanette was actually one the person who brought us into the project. And she was like our key collaborator in terms of um, really connecting the visual work to the design of the furniture. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think to your point, yeah, we try to, I think this slide starts to show, you know, the visual language that we develop is meant to tell the story of the furniture essentially. And we try to do it in a way that it's part of the booth in terms of the messaging being on the walls, but it's also here, you know, almost like styled into each one of the vignettes. So there might be a little film playing on the TV and there's a postcard you can take and there's a catalog and there's maybe props that also embody that feeling. And so you're trying to create this really holistic, um, almost like a vignette or a room that embodies the feeling of that brand. Yeah. And I think that's something that we're really interested in um, doing. We, and, and it's something that we do, I would say almost like, you know, 80% of our projects now is about really trying to not only think about that one message, that one brand identity or logo, but how do you then play that out across all of the different ways and brands, you know, speak in so many ways right now. If you think about it, I mean, just social being one huge thing that brands do. Um, so that's something that we, we do a lot of. Um, this is a more recent version that we did for Samsung actually at last year's Solane. So this was 2019. Um, again, just a brand that came to us and wanted to do a pop-up at Milan that featured their kitchen equipment, for example. Um, and so we were working with them to try to develop, like what is an experience that you could have around that? And Milan is pretty high stakes. Like everybody is doing something really interesting. There's a lot of content developed. And so, you know, we wanted to create a place where people, it was interesting visually where people could go and kind of hang out, maybe eat um, because it was a kitchen experience and be more, able to just kind of chill and relax there too, which is one of the things you need in Milan because you're so frantically Absolutely. running around. It's like, oh, oh I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, I think this, this project is very interesting, not only because uh, it's situated in Milan and, and the way you described the brief um, is very telling in a sense, a brand needs a, a kind of experiential um, moment yeah. in the context of, the circus that is the, the Salone del Mobile, right? There's yeah. over a thousand events happening in one week. Um, but here you combine food um, in, in Italy, right? With design. And so the, the, the message here, I think, is, is, is quite compelling and, and attractive uh, in the way that it's developed over the space. So you collaborated with an artist, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, Leila Gohar, who is a, really a food artist if you will like she's a, does cooking but also styling and so a lot of it was um around this concept of like a three parts of your day and we tried to think through um how we would talk about the equipment mm -hmm. in a way that felt really much more kind of integrated into like life you know how you might use a kitchen and so we had this idea of of kind of a single gesture, which was a table, a Corian table, which was almost like a ribbon that went through the space. Mm -hmm. And then there were these three moments that you experienced. The first being um, kind of morning, which was this brighter, cool, minimal feeling. And that was all about wheat and bread. And then this kind of um, afternoon, which became more about a, a warm kind of daytime playful feeling and that was all based in tomatoes and then the last one was a more of an evening theme wow. and that was like a chocolate kind of darker theme. Incredible. And so this was all developed in collaboration with her you know we would come up with the concept and then we would come to her and say like 
what could the food concept be that would support these ideas, support these three moments? Like, so these were kind of early thinking in terms of what could happen in terms of the food. Um, and then we worked through, you know, obviously a really kind of comprehensive like user journey. How would you experience it? What do you do in each one of those areas? How does the staff interact with people? How do they then like, demonstrate the equipment and also get that kind of incorporated into the experience. And in that last slide, you can see it sort of moving from day to night. Exactly. exactly. And, yeah. and so, and so the can... physical space is designed to, it starts like in a really bright white environment and then becomes like a warmer and then ends in a darker environment. So you're literally kind of communicating that through the physical space. And so, so did, you, did you develop the entire uh, installation at two by four? Yes, um, we developed all of the design for the physical elements of it and the food concept, as well as these kind of, you can see the walls are kind of done in relief to kind of mimic mm -hmm. um, kind of fake shells with food and things like that. And we worked with an architect in Milan to help, uh, like a architect of record to kind of help do, uh, associated with Samsung, I mean with, um, Samsung to help do like the built-ins and, and, and all the You do now have architects on staff at 2x4, is that correct? Yeah, so this was technically an architecture project in our studio because it was really about spatial, um, like a user experience through space mm -hmm. and the physical element of this table. This is all Corian. Mm -hmm. So it was all basically like a really a design build in terms of thinking through how we would do that. But then, you know, like I said, each one of our teams would be kind of hand formed. So this had a really strong strategy team along with um, architecture being the lead and then a graphic team who helped develop all of the texts and writing. And, and probably writing. one of the things that isn't visible in your images, if I can just say, is that hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> yeah. over the course of a week <laughs> could yeah. pass through uh, the space. So to design at that scale with that type of intensity, um, yeah. I can imagine is very challenging. Uh, and I'm wondering, Georgie, how do you, what are the metrics for evaluating the success of a project like this with the brands investing so much money and the, obviously the, the scale of a project like this? How, how do you determine if it was successful? Good question. I think with, with, these projects that are like at Salone, for example, it's all about who comes because they collect all of the data in those cases. Mm -hmm. Who comes, who shares information, how much, how many people actually then come back and request information from them. Um, I think it has a lot to do with that. It's easier to track with a project like this where they are literally trying to get every business card for everyone who walks in um, as opposed to something like, you know, like a Prada store or something where you really don't know, you, you're not literally tracking it, right? A lot of it has to do with press, um, social media, hits, et cetera. And now that's a lot, a lot easier now that those are so accessible and you can really see. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know that you've collaborated with Google. I'm not sure if we'll see a project like that, but I wonder if now that becomes the fifth dimension, um, the analysis of data. Um, so yeah, you, you, you've point. gone from 2D to 3D to 4D, right? Which is yeah. the, the motion graphics and digital. But now will brands begin to turn to creative agencies to deliver that kind of information? That's a good question. Um, ooh, sorry, I was playing a music video behind there. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, I think we're really interested. We're doing a couple of projects with Google right now. We've done um, we've done like an event with them where we helped them do a conference, mm -hmm. and that was a physical space as well as um, you know helping them curate a bookstore and developing all the brand collateral for it and things like that. Um, the projects we've been doing with them recently are actually their physical, um, physical spaces, their corporate headquarters and all across, you know, the U S so you have many different ones and we're working on YouTube and, and Google, but 
the thing about, I mean, the thing I could show so much more work, but obviously we're, we're not going to spend three hours, but um, people should go to our website and check it out. <laughs> Two by four.org. Um, but what I wanted to kind of end with is really just this moment, because I think what's so challenging for us is exactly that, that we were on this trajectory in the world, right, towards experience, towards personal experience. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our work was heading and still is really about creating environments for people to be in together. And so this particular moment has sort of, you know, upended our thinking temporarily about how, how do we come together and how do we create environments that people can collaborate in, that people can have experiences in when we actually can't be together right now. Um, you know, and so this is just a, a images from our studio from, I don't know, a year ago or so where just to show like it's really an open space. It's really about spending time together, really working it through problems. Like I said, we have these different teams that come together and we do really extensive research and thinking and analysis about things and then create physical work based on that research with the end product always being somehow about, you know, having a brand come to life in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, you know, we're kind of in this moment where we're doing this and um, so difficult. all day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, it's only been a year and, and, or less than a year and we're less already so nostalgic for yeah. real life. And, and, and even the way that I'm speaking to you now, yeah. I mean, we had the pleasure to see each other this past week in person, but you know, there's so little of that. And I, and I can say from the perspective of design and dialogue that, that this, show this program is is really about connecting to our community in a time that yeah. really needs to remain connected and so how do we how do we continue to do that um in the midst of uh you know no insight to this yeah and, how and do you no real knowledge of where we're going yeah how do you continue to run your your business which is very much about um you know the, the creation of experiential spaces, et cetera, through brand. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think we have, luckily, you know, we have a really strong collaborative ethos and we've had it for years. And so it hasn't stopped us from doing the work. And I think, you know, this is really tough, a tough moment, but you see, everybody every day. It's just in a different way, right? right? I think if we didn't have a methodology that we already were, were using and that we hadn't all worked together for many years, it would be much harder. Um, it's, for example, super hard to hire someone in this moment because it's really hard to kind of socialize people in terms of like just understanding how you work together. Um, right. So we were lucky in that we have that history with a lot of our employees and that we are, and we're in the midst of a lot of projects that we could continue and it wasn't like starting from scratch. Um, but we did have this moment of just like, kind of introspective moment of like, what could we do in this moment, you know? And this was something we were just doing internally, um, sort of thinking about New York really in the midst of like the lockdown when it was really rough, like in April, May, yeah. trying to think about what could we do that could be somehow expressed in the city, um, you know, that would somehow be able to like make the invisible visible, like bring what we're doing inside our homes outside, fill the streets. And this is like pre, um, you know, resurgence of people getting out there and doing things. This is really when we were feeling super locked down. Um, mm -hmm. And we really wanted to think of a way to kind of create a love letter to New York. And I just bring this older project up because this is something that we're thinking about. Um, this is a project we did for the launch of um, 
uh, NYC by Design, which I'm trying to remember what year that was, but it was. It must be. Five years? Coming on, yeah, I feel like it's going on the 10th. Maybe years. longer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Which happened, like, it happened very quickly in a way. It didn't necessarily get a ton of, um, you know, play because it was really for the moment that it opened. I think it was up for a week. But we did this project, which was this idea of creating a multifesto, mm. which is kind of like um, allowing all kinds of different designers in this case, kind of manifest like a three word idea for New York City. Mm. And so we created a whole interface where um, you could go online and you could basically like insert these, your verb, preposition and noun and then create um, a message for the city. And so mm -hmm. it's just so fun. To how do, we, how do we bring this back, Georgie? How do we get We're this working back? We're working on it. We're working <laughs> on it. It will be back. Yeah. Um, I think it would be, you know, I think this was really specifically about design, but I think to think about it in a bigger way in terms of like New York as a whole, as a city, a community, um, you know, that, that how could we do something much bigger that's much more inclusive across all of the boroughs and all of the different industries that's more like a love letter to New York, you know, not so much about design in, the, in this case. So that's something worth kind of thinking about. Well, this is very much about design. And I would argue that our, our, our role and our responsibility to public space is very much about design. Sure. Um, I mean, the conditions that we're going through now in, in, in terms of inequity and, and, uh, and protest have a lot to do with the, the systems that we've designed. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if we could imagine a world where uh, instead of uh, commercial advertising, um, the city could invest in billboards or signage that would allow people to interact in this way. Um, to have more of a voice in their community and in their on their street, let's say, um, and and I think that this is what for me is so exciting about this work. Yeah, can you speak a little bit about your collaboration with Kiri Mae Weems? I know you're doing some. Let's stop the... Sure. I know you're doing some some graphic uh, billboards with the artist Kiri Mae Weems. Yeah. Um, so we we really help kind of facilitate it for her. So we're really just supporting in a supporting role there, but helping to get her work in a graphic form so that she can get it out there more than, more than kind of de designing it. Can you remind me of the name of the project? Because it's a, it's a COVID response project, correct? I actually don't know the name of it. I'm sorry. I, think it's I should. Sorry. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. But I don't. <laughs> no, 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 it's really, it has the word COVID in it. I'm, we have to look it up because I, I want people to, uh, to be aware of this. Uh, it's fantastic. Hold on. I'm not sharing my screen anymore, right? No, you're not. Okay. But I think um, while we wait for a few questions to come in, um, maybe we can uh, at least give some attention to this, this public art project that Carrie is involved in. I mean, I feel like um, what we would like to do now is, is really try in this moment to support all kinds of <laughs> artists, um, uh, it's called organizations, you know. Resist COVID to, takes six. I'm gonna put it here. Okay. Chat to everyone. Resist COVID. Take six dot org. I um, think everybody in this moment has had feelings of like, what can we do to change the kind of systemic situation we're in right now? Right. And it's really tough, you know. But um, we've just been looking at like, you know, how can we be more how can we outreach more to get, you know, designers that might not have access to us? Like, how can we hire in a better way? How can we, um, you know, bring design to like the public school system so that it becomes something that's more um, 
accessible to kids that may not even know what design is. Like I didn't know what design was in, in my public school experience. Um, you know, so we're working with some political organizations to try to help them through this moment to help like get out the vote and things like that. So for us right now, I feel like we're, we're working always, but I feel like we're also trying to think of ways that we can like contribute in the moment, you know, which is hard. It's really hard to do in this moment where you're online and you're trying to connect with people. Um, well, I mean, you have, uh, well, I'm not sure how many people are in the studio now, but I know that you, you had a fairly large uh, studio family. Yeah. And I can imagine getting together with them and brainstorming. There are so many ideas coming up, especially with, with the extended networks. Yeah. So it's almost like we, if we could make those networks visible, um, there could be more uh, possibilities for connection. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's what this time is calling for. And that's what projects uh, like this are about is, uh, you know, giving voice to the community. So, yeah. Um, Georgie, this has been fantastic. Hey, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's so fun to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have to do, do this, this every all. week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like design therapy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Design <laughs> therapy. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment, but I suppose it is. <laughs> sure. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, let's uh let's do more. Um and if there's uh any anyone you'd like to suggest uh in terms of sure. uh having a voice through design and dialogue, um we'd we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so, I do. Um so before we Part, let me just say that uh, please join us uh, next Wednesday um, when my co-host Glenn Adamson will be in conversation with uh, fashion designer Samuel Ross, um, the Virgil Abloh protege who's now uh, incredibly influential. So I'm hoping everyone can join us. Uh, thanks again, Georgie. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone.